Well, my friends, thank you very much for coming on this wet afternoon. It is a huge pleasure to be here introducing this subject uh, and these two wonderful speakers today. This is not a subject that many would think traditionally overlaps with the areas that I have uh, traditionally written about here at Policy Exchange. It doesn't overlap with the military, it doesn't particularly overlap with the rule of law, and it doesn't seem to overlap with foreign affairs. But I would argue, actually, it's, it overlaps with all of them, because this is such a fundamental issue. It's a fundamental issue about the identity of our communities, the nature of our places, and the beauty with which we surround ourselves, and therefore how we interact with each other. I think this is, in many ways, the fundamental question for the idea of place and the idea of sense that the modern world is really struggling with. Now, it's great that we're here at Policy Exchange because, as <clears throat> you may know, they've started the Building Beautiful Month, which is building on the government's work, building more build building beautiful, and Policy Exchange has already written a report on exactly that subject. We know that James Brokenshire and Kit Malthouse, the ministers responsible, have been extremely supportive. And we know, of course, James is going to be here a little bit later to take Marwa on a tour of London. I presume not the whole of London, but uh, selected areas. This is, I would argue, particularly important today as we are incredibly conscious that the struggle of ownership in our community of anybody under the age of 40 could lead to a pressure to build anything, to just throw it up, throw it up cheap. But the reality is the cost that we will pay for that in years to come is very real. And we know that because we see the destruction of communities with the ideas of streets in the sky, the idea of brutalism that was so advanced by architects who chose to live in Georgian splendor, that we have got to be very conscious that the decisions we take now, we will pay for for many, many years to come. Now, few places express that quite as vividly as Syria. And one of the things that always struck me when I was uh, there, and I spent many years uh, in that wonderful country, was the moment you leave the heart of the city, the moment you leave the walled area, and indeed sometimes even when you're inside it, whether it's in Aleppo or Damascus or, in fact, many other places, you're suddenly confronted with that stark brutality of communist architecture that we got used to in East Germany, but somehow it seems so much more oppressive when it's confronted, challenged, shaped alongside the beauty of the Arabian ideals that are expressed through stone and mosaic and flora. So the idea of place, the idea of identity that this brutalism challenges is what Marwa has spoken about. She's a practicing architect, as many of you will know, from Homs, and has spoken very fluently on this subject, on the idea of identity, on the concept of belonging, and the nature of place to that belonging. And so it's an enormous privilege to have her here today. I should also say it's a huge privilege for me to have Sir Roger here as well, as Roger is one of the guardians, I think, of the idea of beauty and of responsibility in architecture in the United Kingdom and shaping our environment so that it shapes us in return and it raises our eyes and indeed raises our communities to greater heights. So thank you very much to both of you. It's a privilege to be here and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. I think we're going to proceed by Mawa talking for 15 minutes, then I shall give my spiel, and then there'll be a, some kind of discussion between us, and then we open it to the floor. And I think uh, that's uh, the way it will proceed. We might call upon you, Tom, to be the chairman if there is a, 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 a rabble of questions that we can't deal with. So we can Good. So, Mawa. Can you hear me? Yeah? I think my mic is Is it working? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, 
So for eight years now, the news of the Syrian war have been the talk of the world, but little discussed is the crisis that preceded it and effectively led to it. In relation to this ongoing war, Syria has been suffering from a housing crisis for over 50 years. You might be surprised to learn that my country's capital and your country's capital shared the same top 10 list in 2010, being both ranked among, among the most expensive cities in real estate. So London was ranked third with uh, 1,403 euros for square the square meter, and Damascus was ra ranked eighth with 979 euros for square meter. Apparently, as a Syrian, I had a, 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 at the time, I had a greater chance to buy a house in New York than to buy one in Damascus. The report which showed these results in 2010 compared the average salary of the Syrian citizen, then $300, with the price of an apartment in a, in a posh Damascene neighborhood, which was listed for $5 million. What, was mention, what wasn't mentioned in the report, though, that one square meter in those neighbor, neighborhoods, uh, neighborhoods uh, is estimated between $5,000 and $10,000, while in certain commercial areas, the price can reach $15,000 for one square meter. Quite away from, from luxury, to buy a flat in Syria before the war meant that you must have an access to at least half a million dollars to acquire the average apartment, which will probably cost you double to be inhabited and commuted. To solve this dilemma, Syrians built their own housing informally and illegally in what has become known as Syrian informalities. After being built as bare block buildings, cramped uh, uh, and haphazard, the government installed basic uh, infrastructure poorly and neglectfully. In 2010, 40% of Syrian population lived in informalities. Today, after the mass destruction, some reports say that the percentage has reached over 60% of the population. The government before the war used to, every now and then, pick one, of, one area of the 157 informalities to, to be evacuated and to create so-called uh, a development project. Most of what has been built was used, to, uh, was used for the market broking. So more and more vacant, horrible-looking buildings get erected, real estate prices inflate, and people get displaced. Therefore, it was hardly a surprise that when the war broke, most of the destroyed areas during the war were informa informalities in themselves. These areas were the places where violence first erupted and where chaos prevailed. It was a shocking proof <coughs> to the fact that when places fail to create attachments with the people, stability collapsed and it won't be a pleasant sight. In my book, The Battle for Home, published here in London, I've shed a light on the social role of architecture and made the link between architecture and conflict. I've showed how the colonial enforced modernization of our cities in the region had sabotaged the urban and social fabric, and how it, uh, its mode of segregation led effectively to sectarian antagonism and general alienation. On the other hand, the subject under attack, which was the old Islamic cities, were able for centuries to sustain peaceful coexistence among the, their various ethnicity, ethnicities and confessions by the virtue of their ability to provide homes, not merely houses, to people. The architecture of those old courts wasn't simply a game, a game of proportions and harmonies. Professor Roger Scruton's book, The Aesthetics of Architecture, taught me invaluable lessons about the moralism of brick and mortar, and the meaning of architecture. When the war broke in my country, the question of meaning led me to investigate where we've lost in communication with our built environment. I found my calling in those old Islamic cities. By making the comparison with the other built patterns, I've discovered, discovered that the enduring contribution of the old Islamic cities in Biden communities and safeguarding civic peace rested largely on the way their planning and architecture were created. They have embodied the, per uh, the perpetuated values of unity, equality, generosity, dignity, and tolerance. And for that, they were not projects, rather places that people loved, belonged, and cared to sustain. Unfortunately, large parts of those cities were vandalized before the war in the name of false development and uh, by the attraction to lucrative trade, which you know very well, the real estate investing.
Today, the average Syrian city's salary is not $300 anymore. It has become $30. By, uh, but the real estate market has more or less kept its numbers. Less than, a, less than average apartments are being sold now for $100,000 a unit, with rent places multi multiplying 10 times in regulated areas and 17 times in informalities. Bear with me there. In, prepa in preparation for reconstruction, the government has finally decided to look at the informalities, but many wish they, it, it never did, because instead of addressing the housing crisis at the root, it decided to raise off the branches, namely to destroy the informal areas altogether and confiscate the land. And since those inhabitants on the whole don't have uh, legal documents for their properties, they will be displaced. In place, there will be company built def uh, development projects, high rises and shopping walls. The unbuilt 100 square meter apartment still on the map right now is being sold uh, in one of those recent projects in Damascus for half a million dollars. Some of you may have heard of the controversial law, law number 10, issued recently in 2018, which has occupied the pages of international humanitarian reporting because of concern over demographical engineering. The new law put all tenants in front one of three options. Either A, to become shareholders in the rebuilding, B, to sell their shares in a public auction, or C, to establish their own contributing company to invest and rebuild at the project. For me, the most threatening <coughs> aspect of this law is that it turns all people into investors. And by that, it kills the, any chance of creating home for people. Everybody will be busy climbing the property ladder, which only lead to further crises. I won't be breaking any news, any new news, uh, if I'm going to explain the Syrian housing crisis by listing reasons you already know and even experiencing here in Britain, such as the lack of, uh, sh such as the lack of housing due immigration from the countryside to the city, the increase of population and financial crisis and so on. However, the key issue to consider in Syria is that. Uh, Sorry. However, the key issue to consider is that governments like the Syrian and, and the English tend to make the same mistake of equalizing housing, houses and homes. More houses doesn't mean more homes. We must remember that home is not commodity. Home is a community. And it's all too related to how we build and not how much we build. We have made this mistake in Syria and look where it has got us. But what pains me the most is that we seem not to have learned anything from it. Syria is betting to re be resurrected uh, or to res resurrect itself by the help of many beneficiaries. But one category is critical and overlooked is the new, quote, Syrian tourists. I'm not speaking about uh, the well-known Syrian businessmen only. I'm speaking about millions of those who emigrated, whether before the war or during and who are already visiting in the summer, not only for leisure, but also for scanning the real estate market. Like the case in neighboring Lebanon, our fellow old Syrian citizens, new tourists, will buy and broke in this market like in the go good old days before the war, but this time the currency difference is to their favor. Their houses, which they've left behind, will be rented. Their prices will dictate the terms in the market. Uh, their numerous houses bought for investment will shut down blinds all year and open in the summer. So will the lives of the rest of us remaining. If there will be any chance for peace in this region and if we are going to avoid mistakes made in Europe after the war, this should not be the case. I think the old p policy of ownership in Syria to Syrian only, and Syrians only should be back then high taxes must be enforced on non-residency status, as well as on acquiring a second home, whether for individuals or within one, the one, one family. Then taxes should be entirely used to enhance the quality of streets and building new homes. The result will be an end to the, bro to the game of broking, thus more houses and lower prices for people. The benefits of this natural restoration of affordable prices and availability, uh, avail availability of space is that a room for rebuilding beautiful and embracing neighborhoods like once was in the old city will be created.
local businesses will thrive and a healthy cycle of market exchange will be restored. In short, instead of being cornered and expelled, people will find home. Only then, I believe, a road to stability and peace will be open. Thank you. Mm. Oh, thank you, Moa, for that um, very uh, impressive summary of a really complicated situation, one that, uh, of course, only to some extent is paralleled by us here, um, but nevertheless clearly is... Uh, uh, full of lessons for us, uh, uh, in particular about the lessons about the long-term cost of short-term solutions in the housing field. Uh, I wanted to say a few things about uh, the housing question as we confront it here, uh, and in particular the, question, the questions to do with design and how design fits in to the uh, settlement pattern and so on. The question at issue for us in, in Britain is how we are to create not just houses sufficient to provide the roofs over people's heads that they need, but settlements and neighborhoods which turn those houses into homes. This is something you say very well, um, that in Syria there are plenty of houses being built, but no homes. Uh, and um, I think that we, are, we have felt very strongly that the possibility that that might be, might be our future too. Uh, of course, after the Second World War, as everybody knows, there was a, a rush to build new, uh, new housing for people coming back from the war, for displaced neighborhoods and so on. Uh, and there was uh, uh, an urgent uh, desire not just to settle people uh, in a places of their own, uh, but also to create uh, urban environments that would be con contained and not spread out all over the countryside. And this led to some very strange thinking about how we should really treat our cities. The clearance of the East End of London, for instance, and the replacement, uh, its replacement by high-rise estates, which uh, caused enormous uh, social problems and um, uh, has led to essentially to the loss of the working class heart of the capital city. And I think what, what, what we actually need is a conception of how you build a neighborhood. Uh, and the, the word neighborhood, which is an old Saxon word, uh, comes from the um, uh, Saxon root, which says the, uh, the, uh, the, the neighbor, the nachbar, the person who who builds nearby, you know, so that into our very concept of the, the neighbor is a conception, uh, there's a conception of building that, is, that has been, um, uh, as it were, worked into the concept. But it is also, uh, has the idea of the neighbor has come to us with a religious overtone too. You know, the, the two great commandments that, that, that um, are the founding commandments of the Christian religion, namely to love God entirely and to love your neighbor as yourself, in English at least, used again that word neighbor to indicate a kind of uh, duty of love towards those all around you. And I, say, I think you would say that there's the I Islamic uh, version of this, that to build with the, to think always of the seventh neighbor. Um, in everything that you do, that there is a, that there are, there is a form of um, duty here which has love as its uh, as its purpose, and which is that what is involved in building it ultimately, creating communities of mutual support where their affection and and uh, support can can endure. Now, uh, obviously, if you build in the wrong way, you create uh, competition between groups, some of whom have been. It, it, feel themselves excluded, others of whom take advantage of all those um, uh, uh, developments that you refer to, to seize hold of the, uh, seize the advantage over their neighbors. And as you rightly said, in, in, there's a colonial legacy in um, your country, which led to the regimentation and the vandalization of the old uh, Arabian uh, centers to the, to the cities which are essentially uh, 
um, created a new kind of, uh, of building, one that wasn't uh, a shared home, but, but was a, a kind of uh, an asset to be competed over. And we've had the same problem here. And uh, you know, uh, after the war, the destruction of our town centers, their replacement by, in many areas by social housing, gave rise to similar competition, especially among Im immigrant groups who wanted to seize control of the privileges connected with those uh, forms of development. Uh, my, my feeling is that you, we can't solve the big problems that you were referring to, civil order, migration, social, and, uh, uh, tribal, and religious conflict. We can't solve those problem, problems through architecture, but it's evident from all that you say that we can make them worse, and I think that we have made them worse in this country. And um, uh, through the po policies of clearance and, um, and the lack of respect for the idea of neighborhood. And, and policies of clearance, I think, are, you might think these are something uh, are rare in, in human history, but in fact they seem to be a, a constantly recurring theme in the 20th century and onwards. Stalin's re, uh, uh, you know, clearance of whole populations from one part of the Soviet Union and re or resettling them elsewhere, often without any housing, of course. But right through to um, the clearance of the East End of London, we have a, a long record of, uh, of disasters. But there are, of course, some, some successes, such as the clearance of uh, the uh, central quarters of Paris by, uh, by Baron Haussmann under orders from Napoleon III, which um, although were regarded at the time as a terrible injustice to the people there and that involved the loss of very beautiful and, um, uh, and quaint s areas of the city, also produced a, a, a real city which is still centralized and whose population could still live in the new quarters that Haussmann built. And I think that is, um, perhaps we ought to think of that, um, that case uh, and uh, compare it with the, uh, all those um, things that you refer to, the, uh, the building of informalities uh, outside the law all around the city. Maybe at some stage we have to think about how we develop the, the inner reaches of the city in such a way as to retain the existing population. How do we give people an interest in maintaining the places where they settle, uh, in a house of their own and on a street that they share? Now, I, my feeling is that as we face this problem in Britain, we're, we are greatly in need of some research research into what the, what the real distinction is between a well-maintained area which people love and regard as their home and are prepared to make sacrifices to, uh, to retain as a, an orderly environment and the ill-maintained areas where things are neglected and le left to decline and um, uh, you know, uh, uh, in which property, ha property values collapse and uh, buildings are not maintained in a, in a way which enables them to endure. I think that's, that research will come up with a very important result, and in particular the result that people will maintain their environment if they regard it as not just as a home, but as, a, a, as something which is beautiful in itself. You know, your neighbor's house is not yours to um, maintain. You don't go around there with your toolbox in order to put everything right when it goes wrong. Um, and in that sense, it's not your direct interest. But the way it looks is your direct interest. And the more people can take pleasure in the appearance of their neighbor's house, the more they, they come to share the, the settlement as, as a, a joint, uh, to assert joint ownership over it, and uh, will become willing to make sacrifices in order to maintain its, um, not only its appearance, but also the uh, social uh, f uh, amenities that it offers. And I think that's one of the, that research has still to be done, uh, and um, people know, and uh, some of this has been, uh, you know, there have been a lot of reports, Nick Boyd-Smith here has done some research on, on the comparison between the street and the tower block, uh, 
in, in this connection, showing that people do not only prefer to live in streets, but are more prepared to maintain them than, than to live in tower blocks, which are uh, surrounded by areas of neglect. And I think that um, the lesson from that has yet to be learned here in Britain. All over London, we see tower blocks being put, built, um, creating this, not something quite as appalling as the informalities that you refer to in Syria, but something nevertheless that will, within 10 or 15 years, be um, both a, an aesthetic and a social disaster. Uh, because, it, as we know, people, uh, tower blocks do not form communities, uh, whereas streets do. There was a community in the east end of London and uh, communities uh, all over the, n the northern cities which were created by those back-to-back -back Victorian streets of terraced houses uh, uh, in which people didn't merely come to know each other but took each other's destiny and needs seriously. But I don't think there is a, a tower block community in existence. Um, one, one attempt to create such a thing, the Tower Hamlets uh, of London, has created one of the most crime-ridden and uh, disastrous uh, areas of the, of the capital. Uh, and one which is not, not only avoided by everybody because it looks so awful, uh, but um, from which people flee as soon as they can when they've been put there by the... Um, uh, by the social housing machine. So I think um, all that means that, that we have to think very seriously, as you've been thinking about Syria, as to exactly how we build neighborhoods and settlements which, they, uh, which can be regarded as homes to the people who, are, who share them. Uh, and um, I, th I think that it's one of the good pieces of news that the government has decided not just to think about this, but to recognize that aesthetic values uh, the way things look, the way things that uh, look to the person who's not living in them um, are, 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 is at the center of, of the public response to, to, to new building. You made some interesting suggestions about legal matters. Um, for instance, forbidding of alien ownership uh, of, of properties uh, and maybe penalizing the ownership of second homes and so on. We have a great problem, of course, as, mem uh, as members of the European Union, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, something which, of course, we won't be for long. We had to accept the for this supposed freedom of movement of, of, of uh, labor and capital and, and the freedom of ownership of land as part of the original uh, deal of the Treaty of Rome. And that has meant that it, was, it became impossible immediately to say that only a British citizen uh, should be allowed to own land in this country, which, um, which goes against the whole tradition of, of land law uh, in our country, which has never actually accepted that anybody owns anything uh, except the Queen. You know, everything was supposed to be a freehold, but this ownership uh, uh, of, of land and houses and so on in a place where you uh, not only don't belong yourself but have no intention of residing is one of the basic uh, disasters because it, you, it means you have no interest in maintaining that place as a home but only in, its, in selling it on as, as capital. And that's what you're describing in in your country, and I think uh, London has suffered enormously from this. The most beautiful parts of London uh, are owned by people who who reside elsewhere, uh, in um, largely in criminal places like China and and Russia, uh, f where they wouldn't enjoy the same security of ownership as they enjoy here. You know, we can provide security to the owner of property because we have a proper legal system and uh, proper policing. But, um, you know, so, so to the advantage of some so a, a Malaysian billionaire to invest in property in London. But, of course, that means that most of the Londoners are unable to afford to live here themselves. So here we are. I think those questions are also, although they're a completely different order of question, they have to be dealt with. And just who has the uh, title, the entitlement to own property, own land, in a country where, of which he's not a citizen. Uh, well, um, 
I don't know whether you want to respond to any of that or, or whether we want questions from the audience about. I just want to comment that uh, you've spoke about how things look and, and uh, how houses should be beautiful and should be attra attractive to people yeah. to, to maintain. But also they, the combining the aesthetic aspect with the affordable aspect. I guess it's, it's the main challenge. Because for example, in, in the old Islamic city in Syria, people started selling their houses despite being very, you know, very pleasant and very aesthetically mm. pleasing. Um, but because they are uh, turned, as I said, into investors, they have no longer, you know, either they, they are, you know, attracted to, to money more than to residing, or they just, you know, um, calculating this as you know an extended family will have more houses if they sold one yeah. house they will have three or four houses outside of the old city so I, th I think the problem is how to combine both aspects and yeah. I think that uh, taxes is, uh, is an economic uh, uh, tactic but uh, it could could work uh, hand in hand with how to with designing houses. Yeah, this is, I, I agree, this has been one of the great issues in our country. How do you develop um, affordable houses, which are also um, appropriate to the place where they're built and which fit in with existing architecture and which don't lower the value of the place where they're being built? And that's um, uh, an enormously difficult question to answer. All of our, our cities in Europe have this problem. That the, the they old are up to sale. Yes, they are up for sale. Um, the old centers are beautiful places, marvelous places to spend a holiday two weeks a year and leave the flat empty for the rest of the year. Um, uh, and this is, of course, in the long run, unsustainable. If there, are, if there is nobody living in the center of Paris, there is no Paris. Um, uh, uh, and again, I think it's that we need to do all the research into this to discover exactly what incentives can be prov provided to ensure that people do go on revitalizing the cities where they li live. And also, how should uh, the cities be adapted to the new, new forms of life? Any questions from the audience? There's lots of questions here. Um, uh, gentleman there, and yes. Uh, <coughs> Georgian architecture is widely admired. Something I've presated when at the University in Edinburgh, Georgian architecture, those terraces were designed as a solution to a rising population. And is that, are those terraces three or four flats um, something we should look at again. Well, uh, I, of, of course, uh, uh, the, the great problem with the um, uh, Edinburgh New Town, which is what you're referring to, I think, is, is that um, nobody lives there anymore. It's all offices. Um, because the ter the, these terraces are so nice, uh, solicitors and the like install themselves. And that's an, that is certainly is a planning mistake. Um, th those, had those uh, parts of Edinburgh received some kind of a planning ordinance that, uh, that um, c dedicated them to, to residential accommodation, I think um, they would have uh, served the purpose very well. And of course, one should look at the, uh, the way they were built. Um, you know, uh, th this is something that that Leon Creer and Quinlan Terry were tr tried to do in Poundbury to create effective Georgian terraces which would be suited to, um, to the new kind of residence uh, and that would be affordable to them. Uh, and when I first moved to London, age 16, I squatted in a, in a Georgian terrace in Cannon Street in the East End near Stepney Green's uh, tube station. Um, where, which was, uh, I mean, there were 16 usually people living in that place, um, most of whom you did know from one day to the next, uh, and it was a very effective way of solving the, uh, 
uh, the population problem. But um, those th th it was pulled down as insalubrious. That's the problem. When, when, when buildings actually get lived in, they become insalubrious because people are insalubrious. And until we, until we wake up to the fact, uh, this fact, you know, is we'll always be uh, making sterilized areas in which, uh, which will be destined to be offices. Uh, uh, Nick Boyd-Smith, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nicholas Boyd-Smith. I run Crate Streets, and thank you for referring to our research. Um, I have to agree with a lot of what you've both said, and thank you, Mara, for a fantastic and inspiring talk. A um, couple of quick observations and one, perhaps one question. Um, the first is, I think, in the, in the post-war story of the destruction or the abandonment of our historic town centres, there's one important, two important themes that didn't quite come into the conversation so far, which need to be put in. The first is the motor car. And the, the car has changed people's, or it was thought for generations to be changing people's use of space. So we, we do need, as we, because the answer is ultimately it's clear to build more of the type of tight, beautiful town centre that provably people love and will pay more for, which is measurable. So, but we do need to think about, you know, what is the future of the car? Where are cars used? Where are they not used? The second reason is space. The most consistent elasticity uh, in pricing is that people pay more for more space. So one of the pressures that historic town centres have come under as populations increase is there's not enough of it and the flats get too small and people, in particular if they've got families, want more space. So the quite important trade-offs between having more of this type of high-quality environment um, to get, you know, so that we can fit a, a growing population into it. And then just, uh, if I may, one, one observation on what we call the design disconnect. Um, I, mean, I, I lose count of the number of meetings with planners or with professionals I've been in where what people provably like is, is literally laughed at behind closed doors. Um, and the, the themes of what people like are actually the same in London or in Syria or in China or in Africa or in France. Uh, high density or m medium density, beautiful, finely grained, complicated facade that has a strong sense of place, which doesn't actually mean it look, needs to look like it was built in 1830. It just needs to rhyme with something that was built 100 or 50 or 200 years ago, and that can take many forms. But key in this country um, is, is, is fixing that design disconnect um, so that, the, inst so that the, the market works and so that the instinctive and strong and consistent preferences of people are, are actually not banned by, by planning policy. Well, that's a terrifically useful set of observations. Um, and I agree with them. I think, well, do you want to add anything to that, Moa? I still want to stress, uh, ha uh, stress the point that when people own multiple houses and when you have uh, competition over real estate, always the, the nicer places are, uh, the, the higher the prices would be because you will have this bidding, this, th this market broken. And I, I think I th for example, in, in our case in, in Syria, this is how all, all the, the housing crisis started, but because there are space, I mean, if you look at the map of the city, you will find there is space, but there, the sharing of the space is not there. Mm -hmm. So, um, could be, I mean, the, sh the shares are not equally distributed, so one company will have, will have a thousand square meter while a family will have just 50 squ square meters and that's just because people can you know afford more and when you open the doors of the market in this in, in the real estate market in this in this way uh, it doesn't matter how it matters but I mean uh, the nicer the places will look uh, the higher their place uh, prices will be and the further the people will be pushed back away from those places the gentleman there at the back, yes, here, here, there. Warwick Life, I work here at Policy Exchange. I'd like to ask a little bit more about the architecture in Syria and the tradition that you celebrate. I noticed that Tom, and I think Sir Roger referred to it as Arabic, mm. and I think you use the expression Islamic. Uh, is Islamic. Yes. And what intrigues me, to what extent is it some universal principle that you can find in a wide range of different um, Islamic uh, uh, communities, to what extent is it maybe an Ottoman tradition, and to what extent is it very specifically Arab or uh, Syrian tradition? So uh, this is, I mean, this is even a controversial uh, terminology, even within uh, the Middle East, because uh, the uh, the word Islamic is avoided basically by 
people who are suspicious of Islam. But it's Islamic style, just, you know, a, a definitive uh, word of a style like the Gothic, like a, a Christian architecture. You cannot uh, deny it's, it's a Christian architecture, as well as you cannot de deny it's an Islamic architecture, because it's driven from the thought of, uh, of Islam. And it's also the product of an, er an era where, where Islam was, was uh, the mainstream uh, you know, setter of values. Uh, and in, in, in this regard, uh, there is no Arabic architecture. There is no Arabic uh, uh, product of culture because Arabism is under the wing of Islam. Before Islam, there was no Arabic style, which, you know, different uh, tribal styles of uh, whether it's Roman here, whether it's, you know, uh, an ancient kingdom there but after after the islam islamic era there are ha, there has been different styles uh, until uh, you had the final layer which is the ottoman architecture which is also islamic architecture so when you study islamic architecture you would notice this thread that connects the different styles whether ottoman or ayyubid or mamluk whatever i mean you will find this thread which is the the values that were set by the islamic thought yeah. Very good. Yes, uh, John Hayes. Uh, uh, yes. Um, I really appreciated the, um, the 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 speaker's distinction between homes and houses. You know, it is it is shared uh, between uh, corporatist liberals and cultural Marxists that they detach considerations of public policy from the personal. They speak of labor rather than creating jobs, and they speak of assets, freeing assets rather than spending money, and they speak of housing rather than homes. So it was welcome to hear you make that clear distinction. Uh, and I take it as axiomatic that we need beautiful things and that that defines our sense of place and worth. But I just wanted to raise an issue on which um, I'd invite your remarks about green space. It is true that we need to build beautiful buildings, both commercial and domestic, by the way. Too much of this debate sometimes just is about houses and not about factories and offices and all the other things that are now so ugly too. Um, but green space matters too, doesn't it? And not only private green space, but public green space. So if you think of the London squares and the great parks, uh, why is it in your judgment that so few public policymakers take account of the possibility of creating new urban and suburban green space. Earlier generations gifted us what we have, but what's going to be our gift to the next generation if we eat up what's there and add no more? No, yes, this is a very important question. Uh, I mean, is there any effort in Syria to include proper public parks or, uh, the thing is greenery. The yeah, greenery. Green, yeah, greenery was either either within. I mean, within. Well, I'm talking about uh, uh, until the time of the, the Ottoman rule yeah. has vanished. So uh, the courtyard housing was each one's own garden, yeah. and the the public uh, greenery was the orchards. So the orchards next on river banks or orchards that surrounded the. The, the cities and provided food, the farms, were, were places where people go and have picnics outside. Right. So it's a different, it's, it's a different uh, allocation of space than, than the modern urban planning. But um, now we don't have, I mean, we don't have uh, part of, I mean, the, the problems that our cities in Syria suffer from is we don't have this, uh, uh, this element of nature. Uh, celebrated in our cities, rather just neglected to, to a very serious degree. I mean, I think w here in London, London is unique uh, in the quantity of green space scattered around uh, some, I, I can't remember, I saw a figure the other day, something like 40% of the land area is green in, in within the greater London area. Um, uh, and that's a historical accident due to the patterns of ownership whereby it was developed and, and so on, and the, the royal parks and all the rest. So, but um, it's absolutely true that one, uh, one must think about those other spaces which are shared, not just the spaces which people, where people have their homes.
and um, what kind of sharing will it lead to as well? I mean, um, a kind of, uh, you know, a desultory little much trampled area of public greenery between two tower blocks uh, is not a space that refreshes anyone. Uh, and the question is, how do you, how do you get that real, uh, the lung of the city, as it's uh, often called? There's um, another question. Uh, lady there, yes. Uh, uh, this is from the BBC. Thank you very much, Marwa and Sir Roger, for your comments. Marwa, as you know very well, in Syria now, rebuilding, reconstruction is very political and that the government and its powerful allies like Russia are looking for money, putting pressure on the European Union to provide reconstruction funds. Since I think there are many prominent, if not powerful, architects in this room and maybe even a few powerful politicians, I wonder if you could give any advice here about how and if it would be welcome and useful for the outside world to try to strengthen voices like yours calling for uh, some thought going into building, not just putting up uh, housing because it's it's more cheap. Is there any way that uh, a more thoughtful kind of advice can come with the resources if they come to start that rebuilding? So, you know that architecture is political in, in so many ways. Lucky you, you have referred, but uh, I, I think that, uh, and this is something that I always refer to, that we lack the base that uh, the infrastructure, basically, the human uh, infrastructure and the cultural infra infrastructure that could allow the civil society in, in Syria and the architects and engineers uh, in Syria to have channeled voices, to have platforms that they could have discussions within Syria rather to have it here in London or elsewhere, which is good. But, I mean, we have to, I think, the first thing that we should... Uh, build as, as an architect, not as a, as a politician to, who could, you know, take a decision on reconstruction as a whole. I could, I could recommend creating platforms that could uh, cr uh, create the space and the arena for people like uh, people here today to come to Syria and to, uh, for the Syrians as well, to have voices within their country and have the discussion, uh, you know, have the discussion there in Syria and you know build the cap the capacity of uh, of the Syrian architects and engineers and students because as you may well know these that uh, the education back in Syria is 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 brought to its knees now with the war and as future generations being graduated from from different uh, majors of uh, engineering and architecture who, who will the country will depend on them to rebuild the country they are not very well educated and the public as well have lost voice and have lost interest and the message also blurred for them and to to raise this awareness and to put things in in the right place you need this infrastructure as it said yes this gentleman there in the front, yes. Uh, Rowan Moore from The Observer. Um, firstly, there are actually some very good, very recent examples of new housing developments by local authorities in London, in Hackney, in Brent, Camden, Newham, which have a lot of the qualities we're talking about without actually having necessarily a sort of historical Georgian style. So I very much hope on your tour of London you get to see one or two of those. But I want to ask a question. Um, which is a little bit related to that, because in, in your book you talk very eloquently about how um, a kind of modernist form of housing was used in a very destructive way and kind of modernist ideas of zoning. You also talk about the way in which the restoration of historic buildings was also kind of commandeered by basically corrupt uh, entities um, and very poor quality kind of so-called historic buildings were built. Um, I'm, I'm right about that, yes? That, that was before the war, that was Can a problem. Can you just speak up a little oh, bit? Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm saying that in b before the war in, in Syria, uh, this is something you describe in your book, is um, that some, uh, some work was done that was called historical restoration that was done very, very badly yeah. because essentially it was being done by corrupt entities that served one part of the community and not others. Yes, is that, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So for me, that says the problem is, is bigger than one of architectural style. I mean, you can have bad yes. modern buildings, you can have bad 
traditional buildings. Yeah. So how do you, what's the really important thing in this? Is it really politics and economics before architecture? No, I, I, as, as I was telling you, I, I was answering Lisa's question, is that we have to tackle different, different areas here at the same time. So, for example, it's not only on political front, for example, or economic front, only that. You need also the, the, the public with you, right? You need to, to know, because people uh, say now, voices are saying, enable the civil society, ask people what they want. And you may be surprised that many people may just want to exchange apartments or just, you know, buy and sell to have uh, a bigger apartment here or, you know, so the style of architecture would be compromised. Uh, and as, uh, as, I said, as I told you, that the, the, the old city was sold off by, by, its, by its people as well as being vandalized by, by the city authority. So I think we have two fronts here to, to tackle at the same time, to, to give voice to, to, to the public and to the, raise the awareness and create the discussion there by creating platforms and channels for those people and re-educating ourselves. And on the other hand, you would have another voice with you to, to go through the, the political battles and defend what matters to them and be on agreement of what matters. Yes. I think that's a yeah, really important question. And, uh, and your, your reference to the way in which the, 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 the old cities are sold off by their residents, I think it's a very important one. Uh, I remember when I used to visit Prague in the communist days, I was astonished not just by the uh, decrepit beauty of the place, but by the fact that it had the old population of Prague living in it. Because, of course, you couldn't buy and sell then. And there they were. That was a city as it had always been, with real people in it. As soon as the changes came, of course, um, they vanished, those people. Now uh, Prague is owned largely by uh, wealthy Americans and, uh, and people from the rest of Europe, you know. Um, and uh, which, how to, what, how to prevent that happening without using the extreme measures that the communists used is one of the great problems. Um, anyway, there's, uh, there's a question here, sorry, um, yeah, John. Clearly there was an agenda on the part of the modernist brutalists in the post-war period or in the colonial period of, of Syria. People like James Sterling and what have you wanted to disrupt the culture, to destroy traditional forms of community. What are the politics of architecture today? Are there similar, similarly motivated people dominating architecture or is it a much more complex um, situation? <laughs> This is a question that Mara and I have discussed to, to some extent. The, 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 there's no doubt that the schools of architecture and the RIBA uh, and its associated um, networks did buy into the sort of high propaganda of the, of the modernists in the post-war period and had already been doing so in the 20s and 30s. Uh, and the models proposed in schools of architecture right through to quite recently were Le Corbusier and, uh, and Gropius, the Bauhaus and all that. Um, you know, I, I remember in my day uh, in Cambridge in the 1970s that the architecture school under uh, um, Stennis Lasden, I think it was, uh, was uh, teaching people how to redevelop whole towns on the pattern given to us by Le Corbusier and his plan for Algiers, which involved wiping away the whole city and, and putting completely absurd structures which obliterated the coastline with, with uh, cars uh, on a motorway on top of the tower blocks. You know, and this was regarded as a work of genius, um, partly because it could never be uh, refuted by being, being built, you know. So, uh, and I think that, certainly that collapse of architectural education occurred. There's no doubt about it, but uh, we were talking about this only yesterday. Um, even if you could restore the education that was contained in a, in a 
you know, a Renaissance pattern book uh, about how to m match details to details and build facades and all the rest. Um, even if you do that, you've got the other problem of the education of the workmen needed to produce the parts, you know, uh, and how to give them the kind of uh, employment on the building site, which would make it worthwhile to have that the, the learning that they would need. So um, the, the you would need to revise to, to, to revise the whole process of education throughout the building and architectural profession, really to restore what the knowledge that people once had in the 18th century. So you have to think uh, about how to do it in another way, I think, um, uh, with other materials and perhaps taking shortcuts and, and all that. Uh, and while, while it is profitable for the architect to build huge buildings with uh, curtain wall structures with steel frames and glass uh, facades or, or other non-facades, while that is profitable, why should they bother to re-educate themselves? You know, it's no, like... stop you here. Sorry? Yeah, Can yeah, I sorry, I'm, I'm <laughs> going on. Yeah. yeah, no, no. But I mean, to be, to be fair to architects, it's not because... I've never been fair to architects. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm here. They're a new thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're the only one I've ever been fair to. <laughs> so, it's not a matter of profitable than... Mm. That's what, what I said to you yesterday. Mm. Then it's, it's more practical yeah. for architects. The, avi the, the availability of building materials and building skill, uh, skills is to a large degree dictate what kind of design will be made. Because architects are, are tend to solve problems, right? Mm -hmm. to, and uh, so if you, are, if you design something very beautiful and you didn't have any labor to, ex to execute and you didn't have uh, a, a proper building material to use, then the client will complain about the cost. And then you have to go with the practical here solution and not go with the very expensive. So I think it's 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 part um, like we said. I, I believe the the one part uh, one part of so, so, um, solving the problem in Syria to re revive the the vocations that were involved in traditional <coughs> building. So if this was available in in a niche market, maybe the architect could just you know tap onto this and build something that could, you know, use that. No. Oh, no. Uh, is it, um, a question just here? Yes. Uh, thank you. James Kidner from Improbable, a technology firm, but a fascinating discussion and a privilege to hear it. Um, it's, it's, very, it's a very important problem, but it's also a very urgent problem, both in this country and clearly in Syria too. You're sort of getting it wrong has, a, has a, a, an increasing cost that is, if you like, exponential. In this country, we trumpet the triumph of lots more house building, but all we're doing is sprinkling Basingstoke around every settlement that we have in the country um, with no reference to the locality, with all due respect to anyone who lives there, sorry. Um, I, I, I want to ask a question about, about the viability of terraces, because one of the things that has certainly blighted housing design in this country has been this assumption that everyone prefers a detached house. And it, in a sense, ties in with Mawa's observation that the traditional Syrian design was very much an inward-looking house, where people couldn't, in a sense, see it or have any sense of it from beyond. Terraces are, are, are kind of allow people to engage from the outside in ways that detached houses don't. What, what's the way to tie those things together? It's an interesting question. Yeah. Uh, how to, to involve the uh, the inward design with the detached housing. Ha, huh. yeah. Um, I think the passerby in, in, for example, in the the old cities in, in Syria was engaged all the way along because uh, the the exterior of those buildings wasn't forbidding. So although it was was inward looking, it wasn't ver forbidding, but it, it wasn't about uh, ornament and it wasn't about, uh, to a certain degree, ostentation. So you were greeted by, by let's say, jasmine and street bridges and shadows and lights and stones and welcoming doors. So I think you, the, the passerby in those alleyways, uh, still till, th till this day, they express you know, their fascination uh, by how welcoming and embracing those uh, cities were. Uh, 
from from my view as well, the important thing that they were, you know, a very uh, kind in a way to community by not showing class division. So you cannot notice mm -hmm. that this is a mansion to a, uh, to a rich man, and this is, you know, a poor family house, and in this way connected classes because people could live together and next to each other. Yeah. That's a very good observation. I think um, I'm not sure about the logistics of this, but I suspect we're coming to the end of uh, the time. So I, I take, let me take just two or three questions in a row, starting with David Goodhart. Um, but a short question that we can all uh, digest. Right. Um, yeah, j just a, a brief observation and a question. Uh, it, one of the few bits of our housing market that seems to work at the moment is, um, is the student uh, housing market. Wherever I go to a university town, they're throwing up uh, housing, uh, often rather good-looking sort of mid-rise housing. And the, the irony is that the, the one bit of housing market that works is by definition transient. You know, it, it, is, it, it is not producing um, permanent neighbourhoods and communities. It is it's producing buildings that people are going to live in for three years or two years and then go away. My, my question is, um, what... Uh, is there, is there, what about all the Syrian architects and engineers who are now living in Dusseldorf um, uh, or other parts of Europe? Are, uh, are they going to go home and help rebuild Syria? I mean, what, what's, uh, you know, is there a kind of, uh, I mean, I know conflict hasn't completely ended yet, but I mean, is there going to be a sort of uh, a surge of, of return and sort of idealism? We've got to rebuild our country or will most people stay where they are who've left the country? I know the nations are... Should, yeah, please. We'll just take two more questions before... Um, the lady... Yes, sorry, I, um, I know I should know your name. Um, um. Just to reinforce Marwa's point about education, um, in, in my experience, um, in, in Damascus, when, when I bought my house back in 2005, and you talk about people moving out, um, actually, they were desperate to move out. Um, these were people who were not very well educated about their own environment, and they wanted to move to horrible blocks in the outskirts. They were desperate to leave behind the old courtyard houses, which is why they were all falling down. So what we really need is the education, as, as you rightly point out, the infrastructure of people inside the country who can speak up for the values that people now are beginning to realize that they've lost. One more question, has it perhaps is a, a short question, not a long peroration about how the maltreatment of Kurds over the centuries. I promise, Hajir Temurian, <coughs> member of the Council of Migration Watch. We estimate that the population of Britain will be 83 million, the most, the, the greatest among the big nations of Europe by the middle of this century. Already, I think we are the most populated, more populated than Poland. Uh, um, how do you, if you project your mind, Roger, especially to the future, how do you see our future? Will there, there be any uh, green belt around cities in about 50 years' time? Well, there's th three questions. Ma, would you like to respond to those? Yeah, I will respond to the gentleman's yeah. question. That I know that uh, regarding refugee, refugee architects now we are speaking of, uh, the nations, uh, politically, those nations uh, are enforcing such comeback. So, for example, Germany would enforce uh, uh, getting those, you know, those people, those architects, those Syrian architects to come back and, and help in the rebuilding. But, uh, you know, I can't tell, I can't know, because we don't have this infrastructure that I mentioned. We don't have this platform that we could, you know, know how many architects are there out and uh, how far they're in, in their education, what views they are representing and uh, what plans they are having. We don't have this uh, assemblage of, of power, if you will, that we desperately need to, to, to start the rebuilding. Otherwise, uh, just one sentence, that otherwise we'll leave the gap for companies and foreign companies to come and build. Yeah. Absolutely, and um, Polish ger jerry builders. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, well, uh, in response to Hazir Tam Tamarin's um, question, 83 million people is far too many. Um, but then, this is a general problem of the uh, uh, of the world anyway, overpopulation, uh, and it's it, it doesn't 
there's no point in saying we can't deal with that, so give, let's give up. Uh, it, on the contrary, this, this underlines the urgency of the question that we're considering. Uh, we don't want to build new housing which will just lay in store for us, our children and grandchildren, uh, uh, irremediable social conflict. We do want to make places and communities, uh, and uh, even if that means that there will be a restricted amount of countryside, left for our um, descendants. Nevertheless, uh, as long as they restore fox hunting, who cares? <laughs> I think that's about it, really. Um, and thank you very much, Mawa Asabuni, for that wonderful talk. And uh, thank you, everyone, for all the questions. Thank you.